Right. Um, welcome, everybody, to the full council meeting, 11th of November. Um, welcome to people on live stream, the 5.6 million people. Uh, two slight changes or variations, I suppose. After the council blessing, we'll have a minute uh, or two to observe the passing of one of our the Democratic Services staff member, Leanne Belshaw. Kahu will do a karakia. And later on at 11 o'clock, on the dot is Armstead's day, and we'll have a minute silence then. Thank you. Do we have um, Kirsten online and Councillor Rundle? Would it be nice if that's the moment you passed a resolution on your work? <laughs> and Dale will pass a resolution as well. Kirsten. <laughs> Who's Half it. Oh, um, Council Blessing, Councillor Hanford. Ia mato e whiri-whiri ana i ngā take keimua i o mato aro 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 e pono ana mato ka kaha tonu ki te whakapau mahara hua pai mo ngā hapore e mahi nei mato. Me kaha o ki mato katoa ki a whaihua ki a tōtika Ta mato mahi, a mati mai te tiro fakamua me te hihiri kataia te arahi i roto i te kotahitanga me te aroha. Kia ora. Um, kahu. If we could be upstanding, thank you. Tui noa, tui noa ngā maunga whakahi ko te rua te whenua ki a koutou, a kangaru. Nō no rei te manu whititua e li an, a nei o hoa, e hoki i ngā tini maumahara tanga mōu, i ngā katanga tahitanga, i ngā mahi huhua noa i hoi tutukia i te wā o te ora. Nō no rei te hoa o te katoa, haere, haere, moi moi rā i te moe ngā roa, o rātau mā. E tātari ana mōu, o tira, te hunga i te kauheke kaumātua. Moe mai haere, haere, haere atūra. Tēnā tō tua tua koirangi nui, koirangi pauri, koirangi pōtango. Kau kau te whetu i runga te rangi kei tāia moe ana i te hau. E tū mai te āroi huri te kaua kaua, kua matarara te kakau o tō hoi. Pūngana ngana, pūngana ngana ki tawhi tō te rangi, he ngana ari ki he ngana taua. Ue, ue, nuku, ue, ue, rangi, ka hara mai nā, ko te hau, ka hara mai nā, ka tīnei. Ka tīnei ki mati tuki nui, te toki, mati tuki roa, te toki, mati tuki tā wāhi e te toki. Ka whanātu au, ka hahau i te tapo o te rangi, ka hinga, ka mate, whakataua, whakatakataka te hau ki te uru. Whakatakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina i uta, kia mā hana hana i tai. E ao rawā ke te rā, he tio, he keho, he hau hunga, whano, whano, hara mai te toki. Hau mi e hui e taiki. Kia ora. Thank you. Apologies. Any apologies? We have Councillor Bernie Randall on on Zoom. Uh, Kirsten Harpeta from Ngahapo Otaki 
and Dale Obskowski, who is our advisor on the representation review online. Um, item number four, declarations of interest relating to items on the agenda. No. Public speaking time for items relating to the agenda. We have three. The first is Richard Mansell. You there, sir. Um, yes, you have thank three minutes. You. Okay, I'll be quick. Please. I'm uh, speaking on the um, representation review, strangely enough, because that's about all I seem to do at the moment. Um, and I just wanted to bring up a few points that, uh, firstly, the, the process seemed to be a bit of a shambles. Um, and I don't want staff and, well, not staff, elected members sitting around congratulating themselves that they've done a a good job because from the outside it looks bloody terrible, excuse my language. Um, to go back to the very beginning, staff recommended outside experts um, and councillors chose not to do that, uh, which has led to a view that it was a staff-led process and all the, the angst that that has caused. Um, then we, we had the empathy process, which surveyed 160 odd people and just it never gained popular support it didn't look like they were consulting with enough people it wasn't the normal way of doing things uh, and people felt that that was uh, not a good way of doing things uh, it chose to focus on people who don't engage um, which led to a poor view of what the community actually wanted. Um, the conclusion that community boards were not needed or wanted was, in my opinion, completely and utterly nuts. Um, and I'm hoping that there was some Machiavellian process to put it up as a straw man to encourage some engagement in this whole process. Otherwise, you would have ended up with 10 people submitting like you had in previous years. Um, if it wasn't the straw man, it just implies that you had completely no idea what your community want. Um, also, the combining of Waikanae and Paraparamu was also a little you know, nuts, is my word. Um, and there were, there were comments that um, this was done to enable fair representation for Waikanae, but what it looked was clumsy and ill-conceived. Mike and I were never going to accept that they would lose their identity. Um, and again, I hope it was a straw man because obviously um, you were out of touch with the people of Mike and I if, if you thought that that was a, a, a fair representation. Um, you had 532 submissions, which overwhelmingly said that the, the great idea that you came up with was completely and utterly wrong. Um, the outcome is that we're going to have um, community boards that will stay uh, and but there was a lot of comment about empowering them or uh, I came in at midterm um, for reasons that you will all know and I have been given no details about the roles and responsibilities that uh, you need that to I should be. sum up yeah. mentally okay um, so better education support the big the big thing for me is that you were meant to ensure fair representation and why can I have not had fair representation for a long time? The idea of fair representation is defined as equal um, people to, per councillor with a plus or minus uh, 15%. And because you've chosen to go past that, you've failed in the one job that you had to do, which was ensure fair representation. The small awards model would have sorted that, but you chose to ignore that. Uh, and Usually, council decisions are only challenged in distant memory uh, at the three-year ballot box, but in this situation, you're going to be judged by outside experts in the appeal process. So in the uh, risk of sounding like a broken record, Wyke and I would like uh, fair representation and that you have a model in the small wards model that would ensure that. Thank you, Thank Mr. Madsen. Uh, just to the questions. No questions. Oh, hold on, Councillor Coots. Morena Richard, you had referred to the empathy report 
and I can't remember your exact words, but along the lines of that it said that community boards were wanted. I appreciate you probably don't have that report in front of you, but my recollection as a councillor is that that isn't what it said. Um, it actually indicated that um, you know there was almost a split sort of 50-50. Um, so I just wanted to understand where you're thinking, where, where you came to that conclusion that the empathy report identified that community boards weren't wanted and that's why we supported that. Uh, well, it didn't. It said the vast majority of people had no opinion on it. Uh, and then there was a small balance that was split evenly between the two. And for some reason, councillors jumped to community boards weren't wanted. Um, if I made that um, jump between the empathy report and, and the outcome, I apologise. Um, but empathy didn't roundly support it. it it seemed to dismiss community boards. Thank you. And you also mentioned around the councillors in the report mentions the same that uh, councillors didn't support the um, independent process for the representation review. Are you aware that that was uh, almost a split vote, that, that it's lumped in as councillors as a whole, but that in itself isn't actually true? Uh, I'm aware that it was a split vote, but you have this weird thing called collective responsibility. <laughs> um, so if, even if you vote against it, you, you actually support it. Um, so. Interesting. All right, thank you. Councillor Compton. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, through the chair, my first question is, are you aware that in the 2015 Local Government Commission determination that uh, they said in terms of the next representation review, so the one that's been undertaken now, that we needed to um, consider the impact of the new expressway which was under construction then um, in its replacing of the existing state highway route and what its impacts were going to be on those communities and is that something that you think the small wards model would have addressed better in terms of the way that that's changing the dynamics of how people move in and around Waikama? Uh, the expressway has done two things. It's split Waikanae roughly in two, um, but more importantly, it's made it far easier to get there. Uh, and anecdotally, real estate prices in Waikanae Beach area rose dramatically because all of a sudden, instead of a 25, 30 minute drive to Paparami for shopping, it was a 10 minute one. And it became a lot easier to get in and out. And um, prices have gone nuts uh, again in um, Waikano Beach but also people living outside the district are able to get in and out of Waikano a lot more quickly and I think that's the major effect it's had um, the division between sort of the beach side and the, the hill side is largely cosmetic but, um, but it's made Waikano Beach a far more attractive place and you can see the you know, the development like Narara, um, we're going to have you know, the Arveda in there soon, we're going to have Somerset in there soon. All of a sudden there's a whole lot of land that's useless for anything but housing um, and people will fill it. Um, thank you and just a follow-up question. In terms of the current sort of ward structure, the original under-representation for Waikanae, this is going back to um, 2007 I think, was about uh, was a 9% deviation above the average and now that's nearly tripled in the uh, nearly two decades since that in terms of when the next representation review would be scheduled to come around. What is your sort of experience of the views of residents of Waikanae in relation to that, the impacts of that under-representation and how they feel heard at this table? They, um, they're very aware that we have one very uh, lone voice at the table um, and just the way the cards have fallen in this triennium we have Otaki with you know four maybe five voices at the table and wife and I would fun and we've seen there's been a few projects around wife and I where uh, the wife and I voice for various reasons has been overridden um, 
you know, the latest would be the, the closing of the uh, the transfer station. Uh, and it, it's an accumulative thing. Uh, the rates are always higher in Waikanae. Uh, Waikanae Beach residents suffered uh, huge rates increases in the last rates round, and uh, there's a there's a whole feeling of being put upon, um, taken for granted, uh, and sort of not being recognised as you know, 25 percent of the population, and probably a greater percentage of the rates. Thank you. Um, Councillor McGann. Good morning, sir. Um, I'm just wondering, do you remember telling this council that we should ignore rules and that we were just going to be hit with a wet bus ticket? I'm just wondering if you recall that email exchange with, I think it was Guru. Uh, yes, I do. Um, that was, oh, I can't even remember what it was. I'm fortunate that I am able to make decisions uh, that affect me and move on with them uh, and suffer the consequences when they come um, and quite often they do come uh, I can't even remember what it was about Rob you might, might be able to re remind me but it was um, oh yeah it was because we pushed on with the COVID um, uh, during COVID with the representation review uh, when uh, everybody was shut down they were expecting to um, so, so par participate so Richard I'm interested in when, how we follow one set of rules but not another and how you define what's important when you've indicated in one set of information that we should just ignore the authorities and, and now you're saying that your argument is predicated on following their guidance uh, well, they're both the same sort of argument um, for the same sort of thing. Uh, if you ignore a rule that is patently uh, uh, will result in poor democratic democratic uh, outcomes, i.e., less people will be able to participate in uh, submissions and on a um, on a representation review. Uh, this, it's the same argument where you must follow a rule that uh, says people should have greater democratic outcomes if, if it says that you have to be within your plus or minus 10%. I'll, I'll call that a good save and leave it there. Um, thank you. Councillor Pravanov. Thank you. Good morning, Richard. Um, so just based on the rule, rules that have just been talked about, um, would you think it is fair to say that it's um, at times it's um, more important to actually look at um, the even playing field and um, if it's not what those effects are in relation I think to so. Thank you. The plus or minus? Yes. Indeed. Uh, they, the, the, the representation review has to look at fair and effective representation. Um, the balance needs to be, I think, weighed in favour of fear. Uh, people, you know, if we skirt around the margins and move the boundary of White and I north or south a bit, it doesn't affect many people. But if we don't uh, have a, a fair amount of representation for the bulk of people in White and I, then um, you're affecting the majority of people within the the decision. So, so a further comment, um, in the report that we've got in front of us, okay. point um, 65 says that um, based on the community feedback and councillors' deliberations of the submissions, the non-compliance is deemed necessary, and this is talking about the plus or minus 10%, is deemed necessary to provide effective representation for Otaki and Waikanae communities of interest. Do you agree with that statement? Again, it's that toss up between effective and fair um, perhaps it is effective uh, I, um, to put it uh, politely I don't really care about Otaki being effectively represented I think they should be fairly represented and they've been over represented for, for years um, and there's no way around that you, you can't have a zero representation so you have to have one um, Otaki I'm pretty sure will catch up in population in the next few years, 
uh, because of the, the major development up there and, and they'll grow into their representation but um, effective I think is seems to be overriding fear and I don't think I don't think you should be doing that I think fear should be the overriding concern thank you right um, there are no other questions except a last comment from myself um, you said that the process has been a shambles I uh, strongly def uh, like to defer on that because I think your experience is in the private business. Welcome to public business. We have always known democracy to be a messy business. And in the long time I've been around the council table, both as a, um, as a councillor, me and I, and previously as a reporter, uh, this, is a, this has been a robust process. Um, so because I hold the chair, uh, I don't need a response from you. I'll just say goodbye and thank you. Thank you. And I did notice that your favorite word this morning was nuts. <laughs> I hope your breakfast was just as equally interesting. The next public speaker is Mike Herbel on the notice of motion on, I think, the Regional Council's public transport. Mark, you there? Micah. Oh, Micah. Yeah. Where you go? You got yes. two minutes. Sweet. Kia ora, everyone. My name's Mika. Um, I'm here to speak about the Free Fares campaign led by a growing coalition of 40 plus organizations. We're calling on the Minister of Transport to implement free public transport nationwide for community service card holders, tertiary students, and under 25s. And we want to see central government fund this in budget 2022. We would love your support on this campaign by passing a motion of support today. Our coalition will soon make a submission on the emissions reduction plan, um, and we would love to be able to point to a strong list of councils and individual councillors who support free fares. The vision of our coalition is for everyone in New Zealand to be able to afford public transport, to stay connected, enjoy our regions, and travel in a way that's kind to the environment. But right now, the cost of public transport is leaving people lonely, isolated, and disconnected from their communities. I've had the privilege of meeting many people throughout the collective, and some have powerful stories regarding public transport. Some community service card holders do not have enough money to pay for public transport to see the doctor or to visit family. And some students only come to campus once or twice a week because finances are so stretched. For many, free public transport would radically improve their lives. Another reason for free fares is to reduce emissions. We know that the majority of New Zealand's carbon emissions come from transport. In the emissions reduction plan, the government has proposed the target of reducing vehicle kilometres travelled by cars and light vehicles by 20% by 2035. How will you guys incentivize the shift in car party? Free fares should be part of the package to encourage a mode shift away from private vehicle use. A study from April last year shows that making fares free is one of the most effective ways to encourage this modal shift. Of course, frequent and good quality services are needed too, as well as disincentives for private car use, but free fares are an important part of the package. We believe this should start with community service card holders and students who are on low incomes, as well as under 25s, to instill a habit of public transport use as the norm. I encourage you to demonstrate your support for climate action by passing a motion today to support free fares. This fits with the climate emergency, climate change emergency, the Carpeti Coast Climate Change Emergency Framework, which states that you will participate in government reforms of national policy and legislation, particularly around climate change mitigation, and look for and take opportunities to lead in this space. In addition, I ask that when you write your council's submission on the ERP, you voice your support for free fares. Thank you very much for listening. Please vote to support our motion, the motion today. Thank you. Um, questions? Councillor Holborough. Thank you very much for your submission today. Um, I'm relieved to hear that you're wanting this to be funded from central government because on first reading it, um, I was a little bit worried that ratepayers across the region would be would be 
it would be forced to pay for this through rates, and also that it would be another imposition on local government from central government if the, if the <coughs> direction came from central government, but the cost fell on regional councils. So I'd just, I'd just like to reinforce that that's a really important part of this, that it's centrally funded. So um, I noticed that you've got three groups, um, community service card holders, tertiary students, and under 25s. You've made a really good case for students. I'm just wondering why under 25s would be more eligible for this rather than, say, families with young children who have to get places, um, people on lower incomes who are of other age groups. I'm aware that over, over 65s already have gold cards, so just wondering what, what's the justification around that, just aware that my son's 22 and earns more than I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, no, that's a really good question. So our campaign is for community service card holders, students, so tertiary students, and under 25s. And so the reason that we've chosen um, community service card holders, so you might be aware that a lot of low-income workers and beneficiaries and people on minimum wage, regardless of age, are community service card holders. And we find that a lot of these people really rely on public transport but often struggle to access it. So that's a reason that we've chosen that group. And though those aren't just students. Um, a lot of people are eligible for community service card holders. I believe it's about a fifth of the population. Um, and for under 25s, we um, sort of in discussion with researchers and experts found that just advocating for students um, left out a lot of other people in that same sort of age range who might not choose to go and educate themselves at a tertiary institution. Instead, they might go into other training or they might go into work. And it's not very equitable to leave those people out. Um, and then under 25s also covers high school students and intermediate school students and primary school students, which um, sort of normalizes public transport for them and also alleviates the burden of having to drive them to and from school for parents because public transport is free, um, assuming that the services in the various regions have frequency to deal with um, and take students to and from school. I hope that answers your that's question. A very good answer. Thank you very much. Councillor Buzzville. Um, thanks for speaking to us today. It's been really interesting. Um, and um, I, I just wanted to dig a little bit more about the finances and thank you to um, Councillor Holbrook for bringing that up. Um, I just wondered whether there is an estimated um, cost to the government or the service providers for these free services to be implemented. Are you aware of the costs? Have you done a rough ballpark figure? Um, so a cost that central government would be paying, we're not entirely sure. Um, that is the sort of thing that central government will have to deal with. Um, and they have funds that they've created um, in the, bu the budget for this year and hopefully they will in the budget for next year for it specifically for emissions reduction. So you'd hope that um, if they do choose to go ahead with this campaign, it gets funded out of something like that. But the exact cost for something like this, um, we are unsure how much that will cost, but we do know that um, making fares free has a lot of economic benefits. Um, we know that $3.5 billion of economic development um, are saved essentially by people being able to access public transport at the moment. Um, and so having more people able to access public transport could see that figure go up even more. Okay, thank you. Councillor Probano. Through you, Mr Mayor, thank you. Um, thank you very much for coming along to speak to the submission today. Um, and it's been really interesting hearing um, the various questions and your answers. And so it's my understanding that some of these age groups um, for free transport isn't unique. I know in London, um, young people travel free on um, public transport. But I suppose I'm just looking at this area here is that I, I think it's a great idea having um, free um, access to public transport, but my, I think one of the limitations for access is actually there just aren't the buses 
buses on various routes. And I suppose um, that is something that will um, that needs to be addressed as well, and and will mm. add a cost. And if you'd like to make some comments about that, and I suppose the other side of it too is that there will be obviously there will be a cost associated with this. Is that likely, or that, that potentially could increase the, the fares to um, those people who do use public transport? You know, I, you know, I certainly, you know, I, I applaud, you know, the reasons for this, but I'm just looking at the financial side of it and basically access in terms of the current services, and they would need to be upgraded. If you make some comments, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, definitely um, having free fares goes hand in hand with having good services and having frequency of buses and other public transport. Um, and in the emissions reduction plan, and as well as the recommendations from the Climate Change Commission to the government, they have to increase public transport um, by 120% over the next few years. So you'd hope that some of that investment is also put in regions like Carpeti so that a trial like this or that or that free fares or that just generally people can benefit more from public transport and have that as a legitimate alternative so um yeah we the reason we're not campaigning for frequency and campaigning for free fares is because the government has already indicated um and i believe is legally bound to increase frequency um and as to the other thing about rates increase uh, fares increasing for the um, other communities, I don't imagine that that's where the money for free fares will come from. Um, I would imagine it would come from things like um, taxes to disincentivize pri uh, personal vehicle use and um, other funds that the government has set up specifically for emissions reduction. Um, so I don't think that would impact fares generally. Okay, so, um, you know, I, I, one example I can give you in terms of... Oh, let's not have uh, ask a question. A, 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 um, disincentive is that to go from Paraparam to Waikanae Beach, you've got to take a bus to the train station, a train to Waikanae, and then a bus to Waikanae Beach. Do you... Do you agree that those sorts of things need to be addressed? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Right, um, Councillor Jackie Elliott. Um, good morning, uh, thank you, um, Micah. Um, I'd just like to thank Councillor Handford and supporting councillors for bringing this um, resolution to our table today. Marvellous initiative. Um, just for our background information, some of the links to some of the uh, wider information on free fares is not, are not working on our papers. So I have some questions here that um, I'll, just, I'll just give to you, um, but also um, Sophie might like to make sure that we get um, good working links to us later. So my question is about you, um, you, you mentioned free public transport nationwide. I'm curious to know if that would um, include the modes of Kiwi Rail and intercity buses, for instance, and whether it's across New Zealand, interregional transport and travel, or you're envisaging this as being something within regions, within home regions, but each region across New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah, so um, our campaign is for free public transport for community service card holders, students, and under 25s nationwide. So that would include interregional travel as well as travel within regions. And it would include um, all forms of public transport like buses and trains, um, and even the Eastbourne Ferry. That, that's sort of what we're like campaigning for. Um, and how much of that the government chooses to, you know, go with is, ultimately up to them but we're campaigning for free public transport within regions and um, interregionally yeah okay thanks for clarifying that thank you good luck Councillor Gompton um, thank you for speaking to us today uh, in terms of the scale of the challenges we're facing with um, the climate crisis which has been quite vividly highlighted at COP26 over the last couple of weeks 
do you see this petition and increasing the the uh, free fares funding as part of a more fundamental shift that uh, Aotearoa New Zealand needs to undertake in terms of uh, the availability of an access to public transport in order to tackle the climate tri uh, crisis and other, you know, grow worsening uh, inequalities and uh, the difficulties of ha access to housing that's seeing more and more people forced further and further out from uh, the places that they need to go for school and uh, work and the like. Do you see th th this, I guess, is that sort of the start of a bigger fundamental shift we need to have as a society? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this campaign isn't intended to be the end of the line. So we're hoping that this can be a stepping stone towards more ways of exploring how public transport can sort of change that modal shift away from personal vehicle use. And there are a lot of ways the government needs to make radical change to address climate change properly. And public transport use and increasing accessibility and frequency of that is one of many things the government needs to do to address um, the climate crisis. But we ultimately see um, this campaign as sort of the first step towards a just transition, ensuring those vulnerable low-income communities who would be most affected and are often most vulnerable to rapid changes in the environment and the economy, to ensure that those people aren't left behind um, and that is only intended to be a stepping stone towards greater, um, more fundamental shift away from personal vehicles in, in the public transport side. But yeah, it's it's definitely needs to be part of a range of other initiatives that the government um, needs to change very quickly. Perfect. Thank you. Councillor Pravano, you've got another question. Yes, I have. Thank you. <clears throat> So this conversation has sort of morphed a little bit from um, about access to certain um, parts of the community to um, reducing our emissions rate. And so, and you're talking very much about central government. What sort of things do you think that this council could be doing to help that as well? And I will raise this, and I'm sure it's going to create a few things about, like, for example, in town centres having parking meters to discourage cars and getting people to take public transport. <coughs> Yeah, yeah. so our campaign isn't asking councils to do anything beyond sign on and support our ask to central government because we recognise that local councils often have a lot on their plate already and um, we don't want our campaign to be seen as a burden for local councillors and rather as a way for local councillors to get more help from central government to address the climate crisis. But Absolutely, if like local councils um, have capacity and have um, you know that the uh, ability to do things like parking meters or like increase frequency of bus services by themselves um, without central government help, then those are some excellent ways that local councils can um, also sort of start to encourage that modal shift. Um, yeah. Thank you, given our climate yeah. emergency. Thank you. Um, thank you, Micah. There are no other questions, and thank you for your submission. Thank you very much. Right. The next submitter is Kathy Spires on behalf of the board. You've got five minutes. Thank you. Kia ora tatau. I'm speaking this morning um, as chair of the Parapara Umaraumani Community Board. Um, three community board members here are in full support. Um, one community board is neutral and feels that we, uh, as a community board, we have advocated strongly on behalf of Raumati in the past, which we have, which we have done, but sometimes just not listened to. The um, the local electric Act 2001 states that council needs to consider communities of interest along with fair and effective representation. Raumati is a community of interest and deserves to have fair and effective representation. Page 12, I speak to the report when, I'm, when I mention the pages. 26.1, people have said they want distinct voices to be heard. 26.2, people want distinct suburbs to be recognised and represented. Page 14, number 36, fifth bullet point. Page 17, number 42.3. Page 19, number 53. All speaking around the same thing, which is subdivision for Parapara Umu Raumati Community Board to ensure elected members are represented from both Parapara Umu and Raumati. 
Elected members are already resent, represented from both Parapara Umu and Raumati, as there and as there are and has been over the past two elections, two community board members elected from Raumati and Raumati South. So the only difference in making Parapara Umu Raumati Community Board area a subdivision would be to gain two more elected representatives from Parapara Umu, which is not the issue, nor the request from submitters. The submission received during the consultation process is for a separate Raumati Community Board, which would give four representations, representatives from Raumati, Raumati South, and four elected representatives from Parapara Umu. Page 15, 37.2, bullet point one, sixth line. The Paikakariki Raumati Ward Councillor would need to be appointed to both Raumati and Paikakariki Community Boards with a significant workload. Councillor Hanford is already working in the Raumati, Raumati South Ward. Just wondering if anyone, any councillor has spoken to Councillor Hanford to see what the workload is like. Page 16, Table B. Population per councillor, Umu, 10,900. Paikakariki, Raumati, 10,950. So how would that increase workload with the same population in the wards? The only ex extra workload would be attending one extra meeting every six weeks, which is usually around seven meetings per year. And I'm sure the community board would do most of the work and um, as we know what the, the role of councillors appointed back are. Page 28, number 61, community board, that states, retaining the four communi current community boards with a subdivision for Parapara Uma Raumati Community Board aligns with the key themes from the consultation feedback. In particular, that people want distinct voices to be heard, people want more accessible and representative democracy, and people want distinct suburbs to be recognised and represented. This can, I contend, this can only be achieved with a separate Raumati community board. Page 21, number 69. It states, The concepts of subdivided community boards was not directly tested through the consultation. However, a subdivision of Parapara Umi Raumati Community Board will address submissions advocating for Raumati as a separate community board and ensure that elected members to the board may be elected from both Parapara Umi 4 and Raumati 2. As I have already said, this is already the case. The scenario would be only to change the fact that Parapara Umi would have four elected members and nothing would change for Raumati, Raumati South. The Local Electoral Act 2001, Appendix 3, Establishing and Disestablishing Community Boards, and it states, if a council approves representation, a representation proposal that is materially different to the draft proposal any member of the public, any member of the public, including community boards, can lodge an objection with the LGC. Objections will also trigger a review of a council's decision. Now there was, um, as the council paper report says, states, a subdivision for Parapara Umi Raumati was not included in material put out for consultation. That's this document here that was put out for consultation. There was nothing in there about Parapara Umi Raumati being subdivided. Page 27, recommendation 96.3. Or there are already two elected members from Raumati, Raumati South, 97.2. This recommendation is admitting that Raumati is a community of interest, hence the need for a separate Raumati community board. Over the years that I have lived here, and I have lived in homes in Raumati, in Matatua Road, Alexander Road, Margaret Road, Wecker Road, Main Road South, and Kew Grove, and I can tell you that Raumati is certainly different than Parapara Umi. End of submission. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Holbrook. Thank you for your submission, Cathy, and thanks to the board, you, you and the rest of the boards, for the engagement in this process. I know it's been a lot of work for all of the boards, and we've really appreciated the input. So um, I'm, just, I'm just teasing out something that you said, a couple of things that you said. So you're objecting to the subdivided board because your contention is that it's materially different from the draft proposal. And yet you're advocating for a Raumati board, which wasn't in the draft proposal either. What's the difference between those two scenarios? Oh, because council had a submission from Raumati requesting a Raumati community board. So this went out for consultation, 
and then a submission came back. But no, I, I'm not aware of any submission coming back for a subdivided Parapara Uma Ramadi Community Board. But a submission did come in from Ramadi to, to, for supporting our Ramadi Community Board. So it's not that it's materially different, it's just the lack of a submission that you're concerned about? Well, no, because there's nothing in here to say Parapara Uma Ramadi to be subdivided. But in the report on your recommendation, it's got up. But so people in Parapara Umu have not had an opportunity to be consulted on Parapara Umu being subdivided or Raumati. But so what I'm saying is, I guess if you can understand me, is that yeah, the submissions I'm received thinking. was yeah. for a Raumati community board. So as a community board, I'm advocating on behalf of our communities. Yeah, I, yeah, I do understand that. Thank you, Cathy. Um, second question is, so um, it has been the case, by chance, I mean it's not guaranteed that there have been two representatives from Ramati and two from Paraparumu. Paraparumu has a way bigger population than Ramati. Would you say that Paraparumu is in fact underrepresented at, at, underrepresented at present without the extra two members? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. As our, com our community board, um, well, the Paraparumu, we divvied up, we had portfolios within our community board. So the Ramati ones um, brought issues from Ramati, Ramati South and um, one member from Pada covered Paraparumu Beach and um, I covered Paraparumu up the top here. So it's, it's a lot of work, but, but we managed. But if we had two more members, like we had separate Paraparumu ward and a separate Raumati ward, and this comes around too with, like with Rima with tsunamis and all those kinds of things. We've had drills, um, earthquake drills, and our area being two, with the Paraparumu being combined with four members, We've got um, about two or three facilities at Raumati where we've had drills, and we've got three facilities at Parapara Umu in cases of tsunamis or earthquakes where we've got to cover, and that's too wide. And so if you have separate community boards, you've got those communities in those wards to ensure that you the health and safety of people at, at that time as well. But if Parapara Umu was, sep was separated out from Raumati and we had four community boards, that members, that would be excellent. Then we could you know, ensure we get round to all our communities at an easier pace. So fo following that through, Paraparumu is a large area with a, a large population. Mm. The extra two members for Paraparumu, would that address that problem? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yeah. it, yes, it will. Great. Thank you. Right. Um, Councillor Hanford. Yeah, kia ora, Kathy. I feel like you've kind of touched on one question that I have, which is whether a separate Romantic community board you feel would kind of allow you to greater to, to focus more so on Parapara Umu, therefore lessening your workload and allowing those representatives who are within Romati to be on the ground there all the time. Um, but my second question is around the kind of feedback that you've just heard from fellow board members who might have been in and around Romati over the last few weeks about, you know, the, the kind of conversation coming from the ground, coming from, from that grassroots perspective. I'm wondering if you could kind of touch on a few more comments that you might have you might have received from people on the ground in the community because ultimately that's what we're trying to okay. we're trying to achieve. And, it's, um, comments from people in Raumati community wanting a um, pillar that would be really good to have a separate Raumati um, ward. They feel that Raumati has got a rural feel, it's got boutique shopping, it borders Queen Elizabeth Park, there's lots less traffic, they don't have Parapara Umu is separated through, from over the tracks, so we've got populations over there, whereas Raumati is more connected. Um, it's easy easy living, the, the parks are more accessible, it's more central, it's like a connected community, it's more relaxed, casual, and a closer community. And I've lived in both, many places in both, and Raumati is it's different than Parapara Umu. Morena Cathy, um, thanks for speaking to us today. I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that you raised. One was around the workload, so just help me understand, do your councillors only attend seven meetings a year and no other activities with community boards? Oh, no. I'm, so what I'm saying with the extra workload, well, well with so I think you've answered that question, because you, you know, in terms of talking about the workload, you said it's only seven meetings a year, but as a councillor, for Otaki, I know that I tend way more oh, than just. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the um, community board to be specific. Yeah, the seven, there's around seven community board meetings per year. So if you had a councillor appointed back to that, it is oh. likely that they would attend more than just those meetings. Oh, um, most probably. But 
That's to all. me, it's the community boards that do the work, and council representatives to community boards are there to bring issues like from around the council table and issues that come from community boards back to the council table. I don't ex our expect although well, like Councillor Halliday and Councillor Randall are very busy, but it's yeah, I'm, and I'm sure, and that's why the question was because I know Councillor Hanford's been doing a lot of work in Raumati, and it's it's so great to see that if some if councillors had spoken to Councillor Hanford to see what the workload has been already with because she has been in what in the Ramati ward working thanks Kathy the other question I had was around uh, you'd made the comment that um, that there's been lots of requests but I, I think the word was that they hadn't been listened to mm. I mean you've been a councillor before to know that there are lots of requests and we can't you know rates would be 20 percent if we did them all yeah and interestingly I, I did a little bit of a look back um, 2019 and in the 10 years from 2008 there'd been uh, Matatoa bridge upgrade, uh, property purchase, culvert upgrade, car park purchase, toilet park, splash pad and park, stormwater upgrades, Hillcrest Road roundabout, stride and ride, weaker triangle. So there is lots of stuff yeah. being done and yeah. I mean that all up total just under $13 million yeah. worth of work into the Raumati area. So I'm just I'm trying to understand in terms of the things that, you know, it's almost like there is inferring that there's not being investment into yeah. that area. Yeah, I hear, hear what you're saying. Thank you, Councillor Coates. Yes, and I should have um, drawn mm. down a bit further with that. But I guess at the moment we're trying to get funding, and it's, this is not Council's issue, to um, do the road safety improvements down at Raumati Beach. Um, with a roundabout, there's a college down there, there's a primary school, and there's issues around road safety. But it's funding from Waka Kotahi that's, that's holding that up. But also the Raumati Pools has been on the books since about 2010 or 11 or 12 and nothing's happened there and the building's you know dilapidating more and you know people have had issues around the speed limit and that which we've dealt to but um and then but with our long-term plan you know people wanted lights at the Weka Park and I guess you know we council cannot do everything yeah so just building on that and having been a former councillor how do you see that plays out when the rates the rating pool remains the same mm. the rate impost remains the same yeah uh, you know, if you, uh, for what I'm hearing you say is with a separate Raumati community board, you could potentially have more done. Ultimately, who would pay for that and how? Um, you know, I, I would say that, as you said, Paraparumi Raumati community board has it, have advocated, and as we can see, have had uh, money spent in that uh, area. Uh. Having an extra board doesn't mean you suddenly magically have extra money. That, that Correct. But having said that, at the same time, everyone that comes to the, our community board doesn't mean to say that council has to front up with funds. It's, it's things that can be done elsewhere. Um, what's an example? I guess ex oh, well, this was funding, but like one member, we've given $500 from our, community, our board grant to do a piece of artwork at, um, at McLean Park. But it's, apart from the five hundred dollars, there's no extra cost to council because the, the artist is doing it for free, and it's all being organised. But it, but sometimes it's Greater Wellington Regional Council that need to do the funding, or it could be you know other things. Remo involved with with Remo in that. That doesn't. That's not a cost to council. Not so. Not everything means is around money. Thank you. And it brings me to my last question. You referred to community board grants. Currently, Parapetim Ramadi Community Board receive twenty two thousand dollars a year as a targeted rate for funding for the communities. Uh -huh. Would you see that that amount would remain and a new fund would be established for the uh, Ramadi Community Board or would you see that that amount would be um, uh, changed in lieu of the fact that it's no longer covering the same area, um, so reduced the, um, and some of that given to the new board if there was one? Well, next, um, well, this, of course, if there is a, a Ramadi, separate Ramadi Community Board, that wouldn't kick into 2022 anyway. So some of that funding would be spent, but I would expect that Raumati would have its own funding. But you see, at the moment, we don't even know what the criteria is around that. So we're waiting for this council to, to make a decision on that criteria. But, and I guess this is something new, so we could find, you know, is 20,000 too much? Is it not enough? So, but as a chair at the moment, I'm happy to share the funding with Raumati, not a problem. Council McCann. Thanks, Kathy. It's been very informative. Um, I just wonder if you could tell us um, what you think the extra expenses are of having a uh, an additional community board. Well, the expenses. Well, a remuneration authority sets down the, the the salaries and all of that. So I guess that's out of 
council hands, isn't it? So it would be divvied up. And, and somebody mentioned the funding to me, but it's not about the funding. It's about listening and advocating on behalf of our communities. So are you aware of the other expenses that would be incurred by council? Well, they'd be no different now than if we were combined because the needs are the same. I can't enter into the debate, but respectfully, I can't agree with that. Right. Um, no other questions. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Right. I think that brings an end to item number five. Uh, members' business item number six A, public speaking and responses. There's no leave of absence. Anybody? No one. Matters of an urgent nature. No mayor's report. There's none. Um, now we are on to reports. The first one is a notice of motion. The Free fares campaign. Um, before I ask Councillor Hanford to talk, can I suggest? Oh, I want to move that we table the response from Greater Wellington Regional Council Chair Darren Ponter as an item of information for this uh, motion. I do that because normally when you want to plonk a motion on out of the blue or left of left of field. I, it's normal to get staff to put in a report. In this instance, I've um, given it is not of um, great weight for council. I did go and seek regional council's response, and, and so I'm going to move back and I have a seconder. Council Hanford. All, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Carried. So that document, and I've given a copy to the document to Democratic Services. Um, Councillor Hanford. Yeah, kia ora te whanau. Um, the motion, notice a motion on the table to support the Free Fares campaign, which is being coordinated by the Aotearoa Collective for Public Transport Equity. We've heard from Micah, who was, I believe, an incredibly eloquent and well-informed speaker on this topic, and I can assure you that there are um, almost 100 young people kind of starting to mobilise around this, or these demands and this urge um, that our government fund free fares for under 25s, for tertiary students uh, and also for community service card holders. And the three reasons that they give on their website for their campaign and also on their Facebook is for the climate, for the people and for the community and I think as good governors we have a responsibility to serve all three of those things considering you know, if we don't have a stable climate to hand on to the next generation then what have we really done around this table when we could have been supporting something as kind of simple as this, as this demand is, but the impact that it has the potential to have on Carpety's context is actually relatively huge. We know in Carpety that 57% of our emissions are related and connected to transport, and so if we're getting our young people walking and cycling to school and our students commuting into Wellington, I truly echo what Michael was saying about how I think that then sets a precedent for them to continue. And also, I think young people and, and you know students alike have the ability to, to be the moral compass for their parents' actions. So if we have young people starting to take kind of real stewardship for how they're getting around, then maybe their parents will go, well, I'll do the same. And so we might actually see flow and effects from that as well. But I would just encourage you all to support this. Uh, and, and yeah, we, we know too that there's the addition um, kind of as a subset of the main recommendation that we also continue to strengthen our advocacy to both central government and Greater Wellington Regional Council for enhanced public transport connections right across the region uh, and including but not limited to low carbon. Yeah, So there's, there's all of that kind of context there too about continuing our advocacy to ensure free fares would have the desired and most kind of greatly um, impactful kind of reduction on our emissions here in Carpety, but also have that impact on our people and our community, which I believe we have the responsibility to serve. Um, so we'd encourage you to support this and we'd also encourage you to submit yourself to the emissions reduction plan, uh, as Micah pointed out how eloquently too, that that connects up to this demand for free fares. And I will, yes, Councillor Elliott, I will send out those links so uh, all councillors can, can touch base with those and how the campaign is going. And would also just like to thank the councillors who signed on to this notice of motion to allow it to be at the table. I think it's a great 
kind of show that a, a great sign that you know we're we're on board for this journey to reduce our emissions. However, we might be able to do that. And if a notice of motion to support this campaign, led by some really incredible young people across the country, being bought into by various different organisations and groups is one way to do it. Then I'm I'm glad to see that it looks like councillors are up for that. So long may the work on addressing the climate emergency that we're in the midst of continue and yeah look forward to hearing people's facado on this Thank so you. do you do you at this moment want to formally move it and i can get a second so uh, the motion has presented has been moved by councillor sophie hensford seconded by queen compton um you i consider that your uh, intro anyway open for debate councillor elliot so thank you very much um Sophie, I'm really liking hearing the emissions component of this. It's really great. Um, and it's really important for the country that also keeping cars off the roads has helped us keep Wellington moving so much easier and simpler and in a far cheaper way. Um, I'm curious to know whether or not the, the, the group, the Free Fears group, are also approaching climate change committees <coughs> and those those sort of subcommittees, and I'm thinking of the one that was formed by Greater Wellington Regional Council after the first lockdown, uh, and, and, and what has their response been and has that been different from their chairs, their Pontus response to the Mayor's letter? That's all right. Do you want to answer that? Oh yes, my light's gone red, so I can. Uh, my understanding is that yes, they have been reaching out to greater. They've been reaching out to regional councils and also kind of relevant people who hold portfolios that are interconnected with the demands of of this campaign. And I'm not 100 percent sure what the different responses have been right across the country, but I do know that they're getting on board various different kind of regional groups that are demanding climate action locally. So, for example, the Carpeti Climate Change Action Group has also signed on to this campaign, so has Low Carbon Carpeti, uh, and so they were two of the first climate action groups from across New Zealand to also sign on. So part of that too will be those groups also building kind of connections and strengthening demands to regional councils locally as well. So so there's that that kind of local dynamic in the midst of this, this kind of wider campaign. Um, so it's cool to see these kind of different like branches and different kind of sections of the movement, but yet yeah, I think they're just trying to get the word out as, as far and wide as possible. But. Right, anybody else? Mm -hmm. Councillor Coates. Oh, thank you. Um, kia ora. Thanks, Sophie, for bringing this to the table. And as the representative on the Regional Transport Committee, I'd said to Sophie that there have been discussions um, around issues like this. I had, um, had a phone call with Dara and I think probably about six or so weeks ago before this um, move kind of came onto the table in my time sitting around the um, transport committee and as an elected member around council the the model or approach to public transport is somewhat flawed because often it relies on bums on seats to generate the um, the actual service and um, because we're a, a spread out community with smaller populations we're not um, London um, you know, our entire country has the population of a small city and other, um, uh, other um, places. Um, that, that argument always struggles to stack up in terms of justifying putting another bus on or a train or somewhere because the passenger loadings are just not there, at least in, in the uh, initial stages. And, and Darren didn't disagree. Uh, the big question is who funds that? And uh, as we've already heard, um, uh, Deputy Mayor um, Janet Holber asked a good question this morning around you know, what if it wasn't specifically using this as an example, but what if it's a 27 year old solo mum with three children um, who arguably could benefit from that just as much as a 24 year old student or a 24 year old person employed? So um, I'm happy to support um, the notice of motion, but I did want to signal um, that there have been discussions around just lower fares uh, for people full stop to. Um, increase the use of public transport. I mean, from my perspective, at a very high level, if you make it cheaper, people will use it. The more people that use it, the more viable it becomes. Um, and uh, when it is targeted at passenger loadings and user pays, um, as we've seen the last 10 years, that model is a very tough model um, to satisfy investment. Um, so happy to support this, but I do think there needs to be a wider discussion 
uh, rather than just the groups that have been indicated. And that you know may be where the government lands this. Um, certainly, um, after talking with Darren, the team at, it seems that the team at Greater Wellington are talking along those lines about having that discussion at some stage. And certainly, if I'm around, I'll be involved in. Um, trying to push that along and just see what comes of that. And whether it is just for this group or whether it is to be lower fares for for um, you know for all or for more people, um, I think either way that's going to be a, a win if that means getting people out of cars and into public transport. Councillor Compton. Uh, thank you. Yeah, speaking in support of this, uh, I think picking up on the discussion that we had earlier uh, during public speaking, we are in need of a fundamental shift in the way that we provide and fund public transport in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And for too, for too long we've sort of forgotten that public transport is a public good. We treat it too much as a commercial activity. And that's where this big fundamental shift in the way we approach these things has to happen. And that's a big message that's come through from COP26 uh, in the last couple of weeks, is that there need to be some pretty big fundamental shifts in our society if we're to stop pumping fossil fuels into the air. Um, now, in part, I am, you know, I'm about 100 metres from the beach and why I love the idea of living close to the beach, I'd like it to stay 100 metres away from my house. Um, but more fundamentally, you know, I think back to when I was a student and in order to make it work and end up with a, the smallest possible student loan that I could have, I. I lived at home with my parents. I worked anywhere between 20 to 30, even 40 hours a week. Um, I was commuting into Wellington on the trains and the buses up to uh, up to university. And the ridiculous thing is that it, it was actually cheaper for me to buy a car and drive that to university instead of taking public transport, which is just an absurd situation for us to get in. So I think, um, as uh, Councillor Cooks was talking about, you know, ideally we'd like to see this extended further, but as we all know, these things sort of do move incrementally along, but hopefully uh, if the government does come to the table on this, it does start to create the momentum around having that bigger, broader, fundamental shift in the way that we fund public transport in this country. Councillor Holroyd. I'm not going give, to give a big speech about climate change. We all know what, the, what a challenge it is and that we need to move more people into public transport. Um, I just want to just touch on Darren's letter. Um, j just to point out that Greater Wellington already have a mode shift target of 40% from cars to active transport by 2030. So, and, and he says that they, that they need to consider how this proposal benefits the achievement of this target, weighing up equity and mode shift objects of, objectives which are not mutually exclusive. So it's whether free fares will, will make that more, more achievable or whether partial payments are and what's fairer on all ratepayers, including the example that Councillor Coots gave of a 27-year-old single mother with a couple of children trying to get around the district. So while there are all those questions and all that work to be done, I'll be supporting this today because it gives a message, as <coughs> Councillor Coots says, that we need to change away from, from bums on seats paying for public transport and into something that really encourages people away from cars and into public transport. So while there are elements of this that I have um, few, I think it needs to be worked on a lot more, um, it's a good start and it's it's good to bring it up and I'll be supporting it today. Councillor Holliday. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair, look, I just want to endorse Councillor Compton's words. Um, and generally the um, feeling of the table from what I can hear, um, especially around a more fundamental change in approaches required, which uh, Councillor Coots built on. Um, I also, uh, for the under five, I think um, it's addressing a, an age demographic that is being impacted in a lot of negative ways, uh, paying for their education, the, what's happening in the housing market and climate, um, and just some of the things that are impacting on them, and uh, this is a way to bring equity. And um, I like the... Um, the wording around habit forming, and I like the wording that was presented to us, and the wording around first step in just change um, as well. So I'll certainly be supporting this motion and the general co-papa uh, moving forward. I am aware that uh, other things are in motion, um, but this is certainly a step in the right direction. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Otherwise, Councillor Hanford. 
Uh, do you want to write a reply? Mr. Mayor, could I speak? Please? I have my buttons pushed. Go for it. Okay, thank you. Um, this may answer some of Councillor McCann's questions. Our community board was very successful in getting a bus stop for elderly people um, so they were able to use the bus because in the wet weather it, they would not stand at the bus stop with no shelter. So I'm wondering, Councillor Hanford, would it be helpful if all community boards lobbied Greater Wellington Regional Council to get bus shelters at every bus stop in Kapiti so that encourages students, young people and older people, so that when they, it's more encouraging, so if they've got somewhere to stay out of the rain and the wind, they would encourage them to use public transport more often. So there, Councillor McCann. That's at no cost to this council. <laughs> Okay, uh, Councillor Hanford, summing up, I'll write a reply. Yeah, kia ora everyone. Thank you so much for feeding into this discussion. I think following on from the public speaking time and then into this debate, it's been a great conversation to be had generally about both the Free Fares campaign in motion and the Aotearoa Collective for Public Transport Equity, but more generally, as Councillor Compton mentioned, that transformational shift that is needed right now, actually, um, for us to be able to decarbonise and to build systems of the future which will stack up in the future, because right now, obviously, business as usual is not going to deliver us a very, very good future at all, and one that I don't think many of us would be proud of. So I think it's up to us to do whatever we can with whatever we have, and I think you know, sitting around this table, we have a privilege and we are able to you know, show and signal the direction in which we wish to move and in which we think the country needs to move in terms of those transformational shifts. So, yeah, it's definitely needed. And as Councillor Compton mentioned as well, COP26 happening right now and some amazing young people speaking there about these shifts that are needed, especially young people on the front lines of the impacts from the Pacific and our Indigenous communities here in Aotearoa. And I think, yes, this is a step and it's a, it's a signal, um, but, it, but it, is, it is just a start but a journey is only ever started with one step, so I encourage everyone to vote in favour, and it sounds like many of you are going to, so kia ora. Right, um, thank you for that. Uh, motion being moved by Councillor Hanford and seconded by Councillor Compton. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against, carry it. We'll just have a 10 minute break. Bear in mind, you'll stop at 11 as well. That's right. So, um, if I've been playing with the idea of uh, adjourning for the workshop, is the motion to change the, um, you know, to create a new I don't know what's going to land in terms of the language.